Well, welcome everyone to the 29th episode of the Bamboo Lab podcast. As always, I'm your host, Brian Bosley. And for the past 26, almost 26 years, I've had the most distinct pleasure and honor of working alongside of and coaching and learning from some of the highest performers, the, those peak performers in the world that changed the course of the world. What we do here in this podcast each week is we bring those ideas and strategies directly to you, to your home, to your car, to your office, and to your earbuds. You ever feel at times that you're just underachieving in life and you know you've got more to offer and you feel you're stuck on that hamster wheel and you're spinning and you're spinning, but you're not quite going anywhere? Well, if so, you've landed in the right spot. This is your home. The Bamboo Lab was created, edited, and broadcast just for you, all you strivers, thrivers, and survivors out there. If anyone out there is interested in learning more about what we do here at the Bamboo Lab, more of our private one-on-one performance coaching or our, our team and group training, or our corporate speaking, please feel free to continue to reach out to me directly. My email is brian, that's with an I, at bamboolab3, and that's the number 3.com. That's brian at bamboolab3.com. We'll give you some updates on our statistics here today. As of about 20 minutes ago, we are now in 21 countries. We welcome the Philippines that jo- joined in. We got some new listeners and followers from the Philippines, so welcome. From 8,000 miles away, we welcome you from our humble home here in the upper part of Michigan. And we are in 40 states and 460 cities across this great nation of ours. I also want to welcome three new listeners that uh, randomly, randomly pulled. Bill N. out of South Carolina. Becky W., a great friend of mine, actually, out of Hastings, Michigan. And Kevin K. out of South Bend, Indiana. We welcome all three of you. I got a quick little, uh, you know, we as all of you returning listeners know, my goal is to collect 10,000 emails, cards, letters, and snail mail um, letters that come through just sharing what the Bamboo Lab is doing for you and how the guests and the content they share is changing your life. And we are in the hundreds already after the first 29, 28 episodes. And the one I want to share today was was relatively simple. She just said, I'm listening to your podcast again at work and loving the content. It's changing the way I think short and sweet. And that's all we're looking for. And that means the world to me. And I'm so glad to that listener that she's able to learn from the beautiful and amazing guests that we have on here and that it's changing the way she thinks about the world. Keep going through. All right. This is a weird dedication. And every week I try to dedicate a podcast to somebody. And so oftentimes it's a family member or someone who's had a very impactful light, uh, imp- uh, strong impact on my life and world, or it's something tragic that's happened. This is to a woman who I don't even know, but because we did a podcast a few weeks ago on how to be a man in today's society and how to be a gentleman, and we titled that one, Things My Dad Would Have Told Me, and it's to the lady who said thank you to me. Holding the door coming out of a store two nights ago, I held the door for about six people um, after I'd gone out, and everybody walked by with their head down, and one lady looked at me, roughly my age, and said, Thank you so much for being a gentleman. She said, we don't have that anymore in this world. And she walked away. You'll never know that you were dedicated, but this one is dedicated to you and all you people out there who thank people who do do those little things that can make extraordinary differences in others' lives. Let's dissect. All right. I'm really excited about this episode, and I am honored to have the guest we have today on here. Many of you are going to know the name. And But this is a gentleman by the name of Ray Kelly. And if I were to sit here and list his experience in leadership, his experience in the corporate world, and his experience in changing people's lives, it would be the entire podcast. But Ray was born in or raised in a little town called Mount Pleasant, Michigan, where I went to college at Central Michigan University. But he now resides in Minneapolis, in Golden Valley, Minneapolis, with his wife, Amy, and his four children. He's got three boys and one girl, all adults, and I'm sure they are fantastic children knowing the way this man thinks and acts. Ray started off with an Ameriprise Financial back when it was IDS Financial Services, and he worked in just about every role as I read his credentials and studied him that I can think of in the company. Financial advisor, he was in operations, he was a division vice president, he was a, a, a field vice president, and really a franchise owner and spent a lot of time at the senior vice president position. Now, folks, that's a very high-level position, and he achieved it. 
coming from Mount Pleasant, Michigan. And that's what I love to hear is we come from these small towns all across, across the great nation and across, all across the world. And we do extraordinary things with our lives. Ray's just an example of that. He currently is a senior vice president and consultant with Think to Perform out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, along with a lot of other amazing people that I've gotten to know over the years and hope to have some of them on as well. But in my world of, of, I would say thought leaders, leadership, peak performance, and financial planning, which was a subworld of mine, my former career. Everywhere you go, and you say the name Ray Kelly, that person knows who you're talking about. He's a person that we have crossed paths so many times. We're like two ships that passed in the night. He started a couple, three years before I did with the company. And after I left in 96, he went on and did extraordinary things within Ameriprise Financial and then went on to the consulting world um, and leadership world outside of Ameriprise a few years ago. But we've never met. Yesterday, on a really quick cell phone call was the first time we've ever spoken. So I am honored to have you on here, Ray. And I just want to thank you for taking the time with myself and the Bamboo Pack because I know they're going to get a great deal of value. So thank you, my new friend. Well, you're welcome. I, I think about our first interaction on the phone yesterday. And uh, for the audience, uh, we got our dates mixed up. And when we we're going to record this podcast, I was out on the golf course and I get into the car and I see this message from Brian. And I was I panicked. I'm like, oh, my God, I, I, I left him hanging. <laughs> and Brian had left a message already. Kind of like, I messed up. It's, it's tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, we got our days messed up. But my first interaction with Brian was a panic. I was a <laughs> full golf gear and we're not ready for a podcast so it's great to be here you know the correction is ray we didn't get our dates messed up i got our dates messed up you were you were dead on the entire time all right you had me panicked though for a while i'm not very good with calendars i've been known to especially time zones since you're in the eastern time zone i've like uh, am i off no i'm off a day no brian's off a day well hopefully Whatever. had a go hopefully had a good golf game anyway it was any day of playing golf is a good day yeah I'm not a golfer, but I've heard that story many times. So um, I, I really want the audience to meet you. And so um, can you please share with us, who is Ray Kelly? Where are you from? Tell us a little bit about your childhood and just as far as you want to go, Ray. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'm originally from Michigan, originally from Detroit. Oh, Detroit. Okay. And so I was born in the you know, mid-60s and... In the early 70s, uh, my father was an uh, electrical engineer for Ford Motor, and he was uh, disgruntled with, you think about the auto industry back in the, the 70s, and he was very disgruntled with uh, the type of cars they were putting out there. They had a strategy of, you know, I have a car that lasted four or five years and then break down and you would go buy a new one. And he could see it, and that really frustrated him. So he got out of the car business, and also he didn't feel like Detroit was the best place to raise a family. And he got into the, I call it the family business. We're Irish Americans. He became a police officer. So he joined the state police, and he moved us to Mount Pleasant, Michigan. And as you were alluding to earlier, kind of a college town. And um, I grew up there, and, and we lived out in the country, and we kind of I'll call it a hobby farm. My father lived in the city his whole life but wanted to experience uh what would it be like to live out on a farm so we had cows and chickens and um other animals and stuff like that and you know during the summertime growing up there was a lot of a lot of manual labor and i knew that uh i remember bailing hay one day and uh working eight hours out in the field making two bucks an hour bailing hay mm -hmm. and i 95 degree heat and that's when I decided I was going to go to college. <laughs> I wasn't going to do this the rest of my life. Um, I like to f be in air conditioning when I work. And that's how, a, you know, a, a 16, 17 year old thinks. And, um, and I was a pretty good student. And I remember my college or high school counselor, uh, my junior year saying, hey, right, it's time to start applying for colleges. And it's very different from today, um, Brian, very different. So... <clears throat> She said, Ray, you got to start applying for colleges. I said, I do. Yeah, you got to do it right now. Um, and you need to think about a school you really like to go to. And I said, well, I haven't really thought about it. She goes, how about the University of Michigan? And I mean, in my head, I was like, I like Michigan. I got a good football team. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, I like Michigan. And she said, well, you also need a fallback school uh, in case you don't get into Michigan. 
I said, how about Central Michigan University? You know, a lot of my friends, I think, are going there. And my sister goes there. And she goes, great, fallback school, Central Michigan University. She goes, we need a reach school. Um, well, my dad always said, if you're going to shoot high, shoot for the highest. So I'm gonna, how about Harvard? All right. We'll apply for Harvard, Michigan, and Central Michigan University. And luckily, I got into Michigan. And I got into Central. and didn't get into Harvard, so I went to Michigan. So that's kind of how I got to Michigan. Got a finance degree there, and to make a long story short, it was time to start looking for jobs. And you remember those days, Brian, where companies came to campus interviewing, and a little company called IDS Financial Services came to campus, and um, they had finance in their name, and I had finance in my name, and I thought we had a match. (laughs) And um, luckily, they hired me, and I moved to Minneapolis, and I had no idea what they did, Okay. And I started in the corporate office, and my first permanent job was in the internal audit department. And I apologize if there are any auditors out there, but what I learned there was what I never wanted to do again. Okay, I hated it. I spent 13 months, three weeks, four days, and about six hours in the audit. Couldn't, couldn't wait to get out of there. But the cool thing was I learned what the company did. Okay, we help clients achieve their, their financial goals and dreams. We sold them different financial products and services. And I knew that I needed to get on the client-facing side of the business. And again, to try to shorten the story, that's what I did. And I ended up spending 13 years down in Texas, lived in Dallas, ended up running that part of the, the uh, country on the sales side of the business. Uh, did such a bang up job. They said, Hey, why don't you come back to Minneapolis and uh, we want you to run the employee side of the business, help us turn that around. And I did that for a number of years. And um, then I quit. And the reason why I quit was my values were out of whack. Hmm. Okay. I was 40 uh, something years old. I had four kids at the time between the ages of seven and 14. And I was espousing that my highest value was family. And I was probably working 60, 70 plus hours a week, traveling quite a bit, and they weren't my highest priority. And so I took a hiatus, and I decided to become a dad, get involved in school, church, coach their teams. And one of the things that happened also is I quickly realized from 8 o'clock to 3 o'clock they go to school, and what am I going to do with my, my life and my time? And one of the things I was always really good at was developing leaders. And so I built a uh, joint thing to perform and I built a consulting or coaching business that focused on helping uh, leaders develop their skills and develop their teams, basically developing a culture of leadership. And that's what I've been doing ever since is um, um, that coaching business. So that's a lot about me. And then again, uh, I don't know if there's any follow up questions you have or. Uh, well, yeah. So when you were younger growing up, I mean, obviously coming from Detroit to Mount Pleasant and working on a farm, bailing hay, realizing uh, this is not really what, how I want to, what I want to do the rest of my life. During that course of your development, what, who or what group of people would you say were your greatest inspirations and why? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Get the latest insights from top mortgage pros on Mortgage Connects, a podcast by MGIC. We interview thought leaders from across the industry to share their wide-ranging expertise and candid views on critical market developments and current housing trends. Our guests reveal highly effective marketing and referral strategies, training tips and best practices, and what you can expect from the mortgage market in the future. Hear from experts like best-selling author Todd Duncan, U.S. Bank's Lenny McNeil, and Freddie Mac's Danny Gardner. Listen to Mortgage Connects on your favorite app or at MortgageConnects.com today. Yeah, nice question. Um, you know, a lot of us say this, but I, I do mean this. Uh, my parents had a great, I, I, I have super parents. It's one of those, unfortunately, both of them passed away at a younger age. And my father was one of those people that uh, I guess the best way, way to describe him was wisdom. He's a person that people came to, and he always had a level head. And I think I've developed a lot of that. And my mother also was very, um, I'll call it very logical and, and level headed. Um, and I think I got so much of their um, calmness, their demeanor, uh, and the difference between what is right and wrong. I didn't understand this as a, as a kid, um, 
how passionate my parents were about doing the right thing. Mm. Okay. My father used to say, do the right thing and do it right. And that was just drilled in me. And my mom, again, I was, she, she wasn't a person who was very boisterous, but when she took up a cause, she took up a cause. Um, and I think that's why one of my top values is integrity is to see what is right. Okay. And not do something about it is, is a thing of integrity. So if you see a little lady gets a purse snapped or gets knocked down on the street and you don't do something about it, it's either a one of it's a courage situation or it's a, a principle and the principle is integrity. And I think that was just drilled into me by my mother and father unknowing to me as a young man. Okay. You know, I get some of those, my, my, my buddies and stuff growing up, everyone feared my father cause he had a roar. Um, but they all respected him. Okay. Cause he didn't roar, roar very often, but when he roared, it was, it was, uh, there was a reason and they all respected that. So it was always Mr. Kelly to all of them. Um, and I think about my, my, cousins and uh aunts and uncles and stuff like that my father was always revered in a certain way because of that wisdom and integrity and i think it took a lot from both my mother and father of that and then i think about you know i was very competitive growing up as well and i had an older brother older sister and a little brother so i was uh, number three out of four kids and so i was always competing always competing and my brother um whether it was school, sports, stuff like that. And so I had a brother who was bigger and stronger uh, than me. And I got to f- compete with him and all of his friends for many, many years, which helped me become a uh, more successful on um, uh, uh, athletic fields, but also push at me and academically. Um, so that helped. And I just, again, when I think back in my life, one of the things I teach my folks about adult learning. Adult learning is a simple formula. And if I were listening to a podcast, I encourage you guys to write this down. It's adult learning is 70, 20, 10, 70 percent of adult learning and growing comes from doing. You have to go practice it. You do it. 10 percent of adult learning and growing is from books, classes, podcasts. Today is a 10 percenter. Mm-hmm. The 20 percent of adult learning and growing, which I believe is the multiplier is coaching and mentoring. And I've benefited from great coaches and mentors. Okay. Growing up in Mount Pleasant, uh, Joe Apple ran their baseball program. Denny Kuiper won their basketball program. I just think about how much great influence I got from a very young age. And then when I went to IDS right away, um, my second job there was right next to the internal HR department. Okay, there's human resources right next to me. And there were three or four um, women who just happened to be all women that were um, HR consultants and coaches and counselors. And for whatever reason, they took a liking to me. And they put their arm around me and they helped me build developmental plans and take these psychological tests. And um, that really expanded my view of, of, of what I could be, but also uh, gave me great um, coaching. Because I remember the first time I did one of those 360 feedbacks, Brian. I don't know if you've ever done one of those. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. First time I did one, I viewed myself a certain way, very high, and how others viewed me was very different. <laughs> and that was eye opening. Like, wow, I really think highly of myself, and people don't see the same thing. And it's back to the old adage we judge ourselves based on our intentions. We judge others based on their actions and their results. And I was judging myself based on my intentions, which were very meaningful and intentful. And I wanted to do these things, but other people, were, they weren't seeing that. And I needed to make sure that those two things were more aligned, my intentions and what I was showing people. Um, so that was helpful. And then early in my career, again, I had a great boss, um, a guy named Jim Cho, my first kind of regional position. And he thought different for most people. And he he would use that old definition, the definition of insanity is continue doing the same thing and expect the same result. And throughout the field organization that IDS, American Express, now Ameriprise, there was never enough really good leaders. Mm-hmm. And one of the things he said was, 
we could figure out a way to develop field leaders in a different way. And I came up the ranking completely different than most people. And it was because of his vision for that. And then I got lucky to um, work in the same region with a guy named Brian Heath. And Brian was probably the most impactful person on my career uh, in so many different ways Um, because he was really good at developing leaders. And I just followed his play through the rest of my life of going, what's the key to success is developing others, developing others. And um, so I think those are the people that put the greatest um, connection to my uh, success, at least the first half of my career. I had the pleasure of meeting Jim a couple of times, um, or Brian, I'm sorry, uh, not Jim, but Brian, uh, when I was a young district manager at Ameriprise or at IDS, I think it was after it turned into American Express Financial. And I was highly impressed. Remember, I was, you know, 27, 28 years old at the time. So he made an impact just by the short conversation I had with him. Uh, you know, I, w- I want to ask you, I heard a story that you share sometimes, and I don't want to steal your thunder. So maybe you'll be talking about this, something about a lesson your dad taught you and your brothers or that if you ever go, get in, if you hurt, if you fight someone, don't come home. <laughs> is that is that a truth? Is that a am I yeah, did I get that at story. least? Uh, is it? Yeah. Um, this is all about culture creation. And when I was running, when I first started running the Texas Dallas specifically, our first office I was in charge of was the Dallas office. And one of the things that I became a student of, again back to some of these early coaches helping me understand the importance of intentionally creating your culture intentionally creating culture. Okay. And one of the things that I didn't want in my culture was negativity. Mm. Okay. I, I hated those negative Nellies. Okay. We all have those people around us. Okay. And I didn't want to afford that to happen to anyone. in My culture is having negative people in the culture. So one of the things I, I <coughs> would say to all of my advisors was negativity is not allowed in our culture. Okay. Um, And the the analogy I shared with them is when I was young, my father told me and my siblings that he never wanted to be called by the the principal's office because we had gotten into a fight. Okay. That was not going to be acceptable. You think you're in trouble at, at, um, at school, you're going to be in more trouble when you get home. Unacceptable. Turn the other cheek, walk away. Okay. That changed when we got to high school. When we got to high school, my father said, there's one exception to that rule. What's that, Dad? He said, if someone ever offers you drugs, you have my permission to beat the living crap out of them. <laughs> and he said, first, I expect you to say no. Don't you ever do that again. If they do it a second time, I want you to beat the crap out of them because that is not your friend. Okay? And I was like, yes, sir. So that's kind of and what I connected yeah. this back to culture creation. I said to my office, I said, if someone's being negative, Tell them to leave your office, leave your cubicle, get out of here. Okay. It's not okay to be negative go talk to someone who can do something about it. I'm not the person. Go talk to Ray. Okay. That type of thing. If they continue to be negative, you have my permission to beat the living crap out of them. And they all laugh and stuff like that. And one of the neatest parts about this is when I, I, I knew I had a great culture. There's an old story that Bill Parcells, the, the New York giant football coach tells about his first Super Bowl championship team with the Giants, someone asked him the question about when did you know that this team was different? And he said, I knew exactly the moment. He said, it was right before practice and we're in a coach's meeting. And all of a sudden we realized it was a couple minutes after practice it should have started. So we were late for practice and we all ran out of the practice room, went out in the field and we got to the field and they were already practicing. Harry Carson, you know, they're all pro hall of fame, middle linebacker had them doing their drills already. And he goes, I knew it was different. Same thing happened in in Dallas, you know, probably a year after I delivered the message about you have my permission to beat the crap out of people. If they're negative, I show up to teach a class and one of the people's missing. Hey, where's, where's Jim? Where's Jim? And someone goes, he quit. He quit. What? Why? And another person said he needed to go, Ray. What do you mean he needed to go? All he did was whine and complain and bitched 
complain about the leads, the phone, the office, this and that. We 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 tried to tell them to shut up, leave the office, all those things. But we were going to have to beat the crap out of him. <laughs> we asked him to leave, and he left. And I'm, I was like, I got goosebumps. I was so happy. I was like, the culture's right. This is our culture. It's not my culture. It's our culture. So that's kind of the story about my father's story about don't get in any fights. But it's changed when we got older. <laughs> oh, I love that. It's it's what are our tolerance bands? You know, we have to be wider, have wide tolerance bands on certain things, but there are certain things that your tolerance bands have to narrow and you have to have a culture that or a belief system that you'll go out in the street and fight for. I love that. You got it. I love yeah. that. Um, you know, it's I I I'm going to bypass so many of my standard format questions for my podcast interviews today, Ray, because like I said, everywhere I go, when we talk about leadership and leadership development and people development, your name pops up. And with the highest of regards, I, in literally 30 years of this industry and 20, almost 26 years of coaching, everything I've heard about you is positive. And that's extremely rare. Or I'm just talking to the right people. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> I'd like you to, if you could, can you take some time and discuss your theory on leadership? I've heard, I've heard of it. I've heard, I've heard it before, but I, I would like to, for the audience to really know more about what you see leadership as and how does a person potentially become a more effective person of influence or leader? Yeah. I, I, I'll, I'm going to tie this to the financial services industry, but I'll, I'll share with everyone who's outside of the industry too. Because one of the questions is in the financial services industry, they see, the aging of the advisor base, you know, the average age in our industry is getting close to 60. Okay. Uh, a third of the advisors are planning on retiring in the next 10 years. Okay. So th th there's a large change, but at the same time, boomers are retiring at a record rate for the rest of this decade. Okay. You put these two variables together, the number of advisors basically retiring out and also the industry continuing to grow at a record rate in terms of money and movement and stuff like that. Investment News, Moss Adams, uh, a little while ago, did a survey of the top 300 independent RIAs and said, what is the expected growth rate on the revenue line per advisor for the next 10 years? And that number was 14% per year per advisor. Mm -hmm. So if you know the rule 72, you know that basically 14%, you're basically going to double in size every five years. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing a million, you're going to be doing two million in five years. You're going to be doing four million in ten years. And whatever, wherever you are, the math works out. And it's been it's been doing this for the last probably seven or eight years. Tremendous growth opportunity, and it's in so many different places. The growth opportunity is huge. And one of the questions I ask people is: You think about that growth opportunity. How many of you in the and I'll ask everyone listening, how many of you are interested in working more hours? And occasionally a hand or two will go up, but for the most part, people are not interested in working more hours. Okay. They're just not. Right. Okay. So it's back to it's the key jingle block to take advantage of this opportunity and quite frankly, obligation, because our clients are living longer and longer and we're going to need more and more advisors to take advantage of this opportunity and our obligation to serve our clients we're going to have to figure out how to do it differently and the key jingle block the key variable for me is leadership how to get the work done how to develop others how to get it done through others and what happens in, in our industry is uh, a good friend of mine tom nicolosi um one of the things he said to me years ago he said becoming a financial advisor is a profession. He said, being a leader is a completely different profession. They're both professional. It takes 10,000 plus hours to develop the skill set. So when I think about leadership, um, I think if we're going to take advantage of the growth opportunity and absolutely the obligation we have for people in this industry and so many other industries, the key variable is leadership. And I learned this at a very young age in terms of it's about the leader, it's the leader, it's the leader, it's always the leader. So Jim and Brian hammered that into me all, all over years, over year, over year. So one of the things I, um, and I learned this from uh, Brian, and I think it's evolved a little bit since I learned it from him in the 90s, is I use a model called the five levels of leadership. 
to help create a vision for a leadership culture. Now, some of you may have heard of the five levels of leadership before, and it's probably not my, my five levels of leadership. It was probably uh, Jim Collins wrote the book Good to Great back in the late 80s, early 90s. And in that book, he talked about the attributes of great leadership. He had the five levels of leadership, the attributes of great leaders. John Maxwell is probably the foremost name in uh, leadership today. He's written over 25 books on leadership. He actually has a book called The Five Levels of Leadership. And his five levels of leadership is all about the leadership between the leader and the follower. This five levels of leadership is all about the core competencies necessary to be a great leader. And I'll go through it with the audience real quick, and then I'm going to stop and I'll ask you a couple of questions if you're all right with this. Mm-hmm. Um, and encourage the audience to think their answers to these questions as well. So let me start with a level one leader. A level one leader is a person when told what to do gets the job done. Told what to do gets the job done. That doesn't necessarily sound like a leader, okay? but there's an old adage that says leading by example is one way of leading, but without it, all the rest don't work. A level one leader leads by example. This is a person who can say, hey, go deal with the Smiths. They can go deal with the Smiths. When told what to do, they get it done. Now, a level two leader can do level one, plus they can identify problems. Not a big difference between a one and two. I think it's kind of human nature to see problems or identify problems. This is the person you say, hey, can you go deal with Smiths? They go deal with Smiths, and they come back and say, hey, you've got a problem. Not a big difference between a one and two. They still bring the problem problem back to you now level three is level two but they also come up with solutions to those problems we like threes threes come up with solutions so here's a person dealing with the smiths they run into the problem and they come back to you say this is how i solved it love threes now a level four leader does level three plus and i'm going to say this twice because it's kind of a mouthful So a level four does level three, plus they can mobilize a group of people around a common cause to drive a result consistently. So a level four does level three, plus they can mobilize a group of people around a common cause to drive a result consistently. Huge difference between a three and a four. Okay. Not only when told what to do, get the job done, they then identify a problem. They then come up with solutions. They then put systems and processes in place so we don't run into this problem again. They train everyone in your organization around it. They mobilize the people. Holy smokes. They don't do it just once. They do it consistently. That's a four. Now, a level five leader does level four, plus they tie everything back, everything that's being done, everything back to the vision, mission, and values of the organization or the individual, the bigger why, And most importantly, what a five does is they develop other level five pluses or four pluses. So let me freeze right here. We're going to play the freeze game, Brian. All right. So, Brian, freeze. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What are you doing right at this moment when I said freeze? You're thinking, feeling, and doing. I'm thinking what level I am. I'm feeling that I'm not level five. And I put my pencil down and stopped writing to listen to you. All right. You're hitting on some the big things. 90% of the time, 90% of the people will be thinking one, if not all three, or feeling one, or all, if not all three of these things. Number one, what number am I? Mm-hmm. They're self-assessing. Number two, especially if they're in a leadership role, they're wondering what number are the people around me. Hey, my sister, she does, hey, this, hey, this. They're, they're assessing their entire organization. And number three, they're saying, how do I move myself and others up? Mm. Okay, think about it. self-assessment, self-awareness, inspiration, motivation. The five levels of leadership in the, the teams that I led, the organizations that I led, is basically a vision state of what we're trying to create, a level five culture where leaders develop leaders. That we continue to develop folks. So um, years ago, my son, uh, this is my number two son. I, I number my kids. I don't give <laughs> names anymore. It's easier this way. My number two son got, had a job working for um, one of my clients. And he was 18 years old in the summer internship. 
and he had a great job. Uh, the organization was going paperless, so he got to scan documents all summer long. He hated it. Okay. So one day he comes home from work. I say, I'll give his name because it's just he's your brain, man. How was work today? And he said, it was great. And this was, well, that's different. Well, what was great about it? He said, we had an offsite. Really? Which guys do? And he talked about the offsite. He said, yeah, but the best part of the day was Seth did a breakout session. He did a leadership development session. Seth used to be one of my clients that I had taught the five levels of leadership to. I said, what did what you guys cover? This we covered something called the five levels of leadership. <laughs> and no idea came from me. And I just said, hey, well, tell me about it. I'd love to hear it. And he went through it just as I just went through it with you. And at the end of it, he goes, you know what, Dad? I aspire to be a level five someday. I'm like, Brian, that's great, man. Uh, you know, one of the cool things is this is what your dad does for a living. I help develop leaders. Wow, oh, I really like your help. I said, great, man. Look forward to helping you over the time. It's, and I went through the whole thing. It's a profession. It's a profession. You got to, yeah, I know, Dad. I've got to work on it. Well, about a week later, I come home from a business trip and the cab drops me off at the bottom of the driveway and I'm walking up the driveway with my suitcase in tow and my 18 year old son meets me in the driveway. So Brian, what's your self-talk? What was my self-talk when your 18 year old son comes out of the house to meet you in the driveway? What do you think I was thinking? I would, if my, if it was, if it was me and my, I would, I don't, I would feel extremely proud. I would feel or, or scared. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's probably the latter because you're going. What's wrong? Yeah, like he, he, either he wants to give me a big hug and because I'm I raised him right, or he, something happened that he needs to tell me right away. You got it. It's back to when they were five and six, seven and eight. They come out and give you that big hug. When eighteen, they stop doing that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. it's usually something's wrong, and that's what my self talk is. Uh oh, what's wrong? And all of a sudden, it went something like this. Hey, Dad. I was like, Hey, Brayden, how you doing? And then he does a head shake and does, the Kelly house is out of food. <laughs> okay. My self-talk immediately went, whoosh, nothing yeah. too serious, but it's the last thing I want to deal with. And I say to Braden, what level of leadership is that? And he thinks about it for a second and goes, level two, I identified a problem. I said, exactly. When you can get to level four, come find me. <laughs> I walked into the house. No, it's to, to his credit. 15 minutes later, he came by. He had his little brother in tow. He had a grocery list put together. He said, hey, Dad, I got Tristan here with me. We talked to Ryan, the older brother. I talked to Bridget, the younger sister. And we got a grocery list and got a magnet, so we've got a kind of system to put it on the refrigerator. And all I need is some money, and I'll go to the grocery store and pick up these groceries. Now, I share that with you, not because mm. I'm so wise, but I share that with people because how often do we stunt the growth of our people because we allow them mm. to bring us problems? Mm. We allow them to just take orders. We don't expect from them to come up with solutions, learn the skill set of how to mobilize a group of people on a common cause to drive a result. Because one of the challenges about the five levels of leadership, Brian, is a one often can't see what a two does. Mm -hmm. A two doesn't often see what a three does. They may have the same title and position, and one of them gets the job done, one told with the two, another one can get the job done and bring problem to the boss, and another one all of a sudden they've got the same title, but they come up with solutions. Again, the boss loves to the level three. Mm-hmm. And definitely a one doesn't see what a five does. Right. Okay. When you think back to your early days with IDS American Express, there was a guy named Harvey Golub, yeah. who was the CEO, and then became the CEO of American Express and I started 1988 with IDS, and and I remember every six every six months or so, Harvey would do a town hall, State of the Union address, and every single speech, he talked about vision, mission, and values. I thought he needed a new speechwriter. Oh my God! If I heard this one more time, oh, this is terrible. This is terrible. I was a level one. When told what to do, I can get the job done. He was a five. He was connecting everything back to a bigger why, a vision, mission, and values. Doug Lennon told me a story. He said, Ray, oh, by the way, Doug reported to, to Harvey for a period of time. He said, Harvey, to his executive team, if he was sitting in the meeting, 
and you didn't connect back your your strategy, your plan, whatever you were working on to the bigger why, the values of the vision, you were fired. I was like, wow. He said he gave you one mulligan. And it wasn't a very nice mulligan. He scolded you. And you better connect it back. Don't assume your people connect why um, the change of coffee was to better serve the client, which is part of our vision, our values. Don't assume people know the change here, the change here. All these different things are connected back. That's what a five does. Because here's one of the things for all the people out there who are doing the self-assessment in their organization is they're listening. Because this is one of the questions I ask all my clients. I say, how many level four pluses do you have in your organization? Okay. People that can mobilize a group of people around a common cause to drive a result consistently with one caveat. And that caveat is without your involvement. Brian, you could be in Europe for six weeks, six months, and they could still mobilize around a common cause and drive a result without your involvement. And you'd be surprised the numbers. I, I, I did listen to your podcast recently with Bill Williams and the conversation I had with Bill a um, number of years ago. And he thought about it for like two minutes. And he came up with the exact number. Okay. And all of them in the field organization that he led. He gives me the number. And it's the same number for all of you. Whatever number you came up, number four pluses. What would happen to the growth of your organization if you could double that number? Some of you, the number's one. But what if you had a second person? What, and then I said to Bill, what would happen to the growth of your organization if you could add a zero to it? You had a level five culture where we have leaders developing leaders. Then you get hyper growth. That's my leadership philosophy right there. Is it's, it's the leader, it's the leader, and that's where the multiplication occurs is when you can create a culture where, where we're developing leaders. Uh, you, for the Bamboo Pack listeners out there, I hope – you had a piece of paper or have a piece of paper and a pen, or if you're driving, you will go home or to your office and re-listen to this podcast and write down. I have spent almost 26 years in developing people, peak performance. And I learned so far, I've got a full page of notes here already. And I hope I caught everything, but I'm not sure that I did. (laughs) I'm going to, I'm going to recap quickly what I've gotten so far out of what Ray has said. And and this is not any particular order, but sometimes this helps you listener to, to grasp it a little bit better. I think um, the one story that I really enjoyed was that at one point in Ray's highly successful life in the corporate world, he realized his values were out of whack. You know, his, he always espoused his values to be family, but he realized working 60 plus hours a week his espoused values were a little bit different than his actualized actualized values. So he took a sabbatical and spent time with his family, going to ball games, taking going to you know t- taking kids to school. How many people have the balls to do that? How many people have the courage to step out of their comfort zone and do something like that? No, I know a lot of people can't afford to leave their jobs, but we can we can always afford to drop something in our personal lives or something we're doing to spend more time with our loved ones or to or to chase that dream that we have, that thing that we value most in life. Um, I, I really like the adult learning. You know, seventy percent is practice and, and doing. Ten percent is, is the uh, is the uh, classes and the podcasts and the books and the lectures and the videos we watch. Uh, TED talks. Twenty percent is the coaching and mentoring. And of course, from my perspective, my I like that one. That's the multiplier. <laughs> and and the thing I think that that Ray said too that I've always believed in that I think the audience has never heard yet on this podcast is when we're looking at. Uh, other people were judging. We judge ourselves by our intentions, what we mean to do and what we meant to do, but we judge others unfairly by their actions. And it would be really powerful if we could switch that around, judge ourselves by our actions and judge other people more by their intentions. And especially in, the, in this divisive world that we have right now, that could be an incredibly powerful tool. And I really liked also this intentionally create a culture that's that's not has no negativity. And I think out there, whether you're in the business world or whether you are a staying at home, a stay at home parent or whatever it might be, you are all, we are all part of a culture, whatever it is, friend groups, teams that we play in uh, summer league baseball, whatever it is, we are a cult. We have cultures around us. So we're all in multiple cultures. What if we intentionally as leaders create those cultures where it's positive only? 
positive only because we know that between two human beings there are no negative interactions it's either positive or, or, or it's, there's no neutral interactions i'm sorry it's either positive or negative every exchange between two human beings is energy exchange and energy energy can't be really neutralized it's either positive or negative negative. and if we focus strictly on eliminating the negative and saying positive only and to create that culture where somebody somebody says hey um we gave them a chance we gave her a chance and if they didn't leave we were going to have to beat them up I mean, just like like <laughs> Mr. Kelly Sr., Mr. Kelly Ray's father taught him, and he and his brothers. I mean, that's powerful stuff. This five levels of leadership, I mean, it's it's eye opening to me. Uh, I because I really I was looking at this, going, you know, where am I in this? And you know, it really has given made me give myself a really good audit. And regardless, I mean, he used the example of his son, Braden, Braden, right? Yes. I mean, you, you can use this not just with employees. If you don't have employees or you're not technically leading somebody at work, you're leading somebody in life because somebody's looking to you for leadership, a child, a friend, a relative, a coworker. And to really be able to help them to help yourself grow from level uh, level one to level five and, by, and bring them up with you. I mean, this is gold stuff, folks. This is gold. This is incredible. I think the greatest thing so far I got of this, and I found the title for today's podcast and something Bill's parents taught him do the right thing or do the right thing and do it right. That sums up so much of what Ray's been telling, talking about here. Um, and during this podcast is, is exactly what uh, his, his parents told him uh, throughout the course of his growing up. So uh, that's, so, I mean, I still got a lot more. I mean, you know, talking about self-assessment and then ask, you know, when you look at the five uh, levels, where am I self-assessed? Where are the people around me? Um, and you know, I, I just think this is great stuff for all of us. And so many of the listeners out there, you know, you can take this and apply it to every aspect of your living being. I knew this was going to be a good, good con- podcast for quality content, just, uh, knowing Ray's background and hearing so many stories about Ray. And I, I've been told many times he's a very prolific story uh, teller. And I found that to be true today for sure. Um, I question for you, Ray, and I, I don't know, did I say Bill or did I say Ray? I think I called you Bill a few minutes ago. You mentioned Bill's name earlier. Yeah, sorry about that. I mean, Ray. Don't worry, I picked it up. <laughs> you know, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, when you said Bill, it's, I was I wrote his name down. Um, I had an opportunity in Monterey, California back in probably 1995. I was out there in a leadership conference, and Harvey Golub gave a keynote speech. And yeah. at the time, he left the building, and he walked to the helicopter, Um and nobody followed him. And I thought, that's, I mean, he had somebody with him, but nobody from the audience. And so I ran out and t- walked right alongside of him, introduced myself. And I remember him saying, oh, so you're one of Hans's boys, eh? And I said, yeah, I, I work for the Detroit region. And we just talked for, it might have been 30 seconds. It seemed like three hours. And it, I, it was one of those, I was so proud that at 28 years, 27 years old, whatever I was, I, I had the courage to do that. And it made a big impact on me because he talked to me just like we were having a beer at a restaurant. You know, it was really a great, uh, good experience. I, I remember that conference. Oh, you, you do? Uh, oh, yeah. From, back to his prolific storyteller, Harvey. This is after he became the CEO of American Express, and this was his first time back to uh, American Express Financial Advisor, IDS. So it was, it was like the conquering king coming back to his home kingdom, and we were all so happy to see him, and he gave his speech. and. Uh, then he did, had a Q and A session, and I don't know if you remember this, but it has a profound impact. It microphones on both sides of the floor, and people would come up and say, "Hey, this is uh, Jim Smith. I'm a district manager from Provo, Utah. My question is, okay." And one of the first people that came up said that, "Hey, I'm Jim Smith. I'm a uh, district manager from Provo, Utah. I want to ask you a question about compensation." And he asked this question, and it was it was a whining question. He was whining about comp change or something. And Harvey does this. <laughs> he goes, I would like you to repeat your name and where you're from because I want everyone to know who asked such a stupid question. <laughs> and I mean, the whole air, the whole place went, oh, <gasps> like his knees fell out. And he just went to the next question, pointed to the next person. I'm like, you were brave, Ryan, to go talk to him after that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, I better not uh, say something really dumb because this guy is, he's going to go, I want everyone to know who asked such a dumb question. I'm not sure the questions I asked him, but he didn't say that to me. I, I think I was just a little, you know, starstruck talking to him, walking to the helicopter. <laughs> what was I was I'm probably like you. I, I remember doing a, um, I was a young leader and 
I was moved by the presentation of the person. And I'm usually not one of those guys who's brave enough to go talk to the person afterwards. But I stood in the line and I went out and talked to this person. And this is kind of back to this living in alignment stuff that I talked about earlier. And I said to the speaker, I said, what if you're this, if you're a different person at work than you're at home? Hmm. And I remember his answer because it was really brief, short to the point. He said, you need to figure out which one's the real you. Ooh. And he went to the next person. And what a great message because he was right. I was trying really, really, really hard at work. Okay. And I wasn't trying to be that ideal person at home. And I was like, I need to figure out which one's the real me. And it's the one's trying all of my life in all of these places. But boy, what a short start answer about living in alignment. And I'll never forget that, that <laughs> your Harvey Gallup moment. I had that <laughs> moment with the speaker too. You know, I think that what you just shared there, Ray, is going to have a lot of impact on so many of the listeners because I hear that so often that they find that they, they're they trying to find what they call a life balance, it's, which is a difficult thing to have. But really what it comes down to is, is I call it a life blend. You know, being blend your life so that, you know, work and family aren't completely separated where they're not competing against each other, where you blend them together, you include both into each and you live a life that's more living consciously, so to speak. And so many people struggle with that. They feel like they're giving too much time to to work and they're watching their children grow up or their grandchildren and they're, they're stuck in that. And that really is quite frankly, another form of the hamster wheel. They can be highly successful in achieving great things financially and, and professionally, but really they're stuck on a different kind of hamster wheel because they're spinning and spinning and they're not going in the direction they want to go. And I think that's a great response is to ask the, to the audience out there, who do you want to, who's the real you? I love that. Sometimes the shortest question and responses are the most effective. I, yeah, love I, that. I, I agree with you. So I think you're spot on there. What's next for you, Ray? <laughs> well, I, I'm one of those fortunate few. Uh, I heard a podcast with uh, Dave Dick recently, a friend of both of ours. Mm -hmm. And he talked about uh, his purpose. And one of the things I commented to him about was very few people actually even ask themselves that question what is my purpose and even fewer look for the answer and even fewer find the answer and even fewer than that get to live in alignment with their purpose it's kind of i just said to david it's heaven when you get to, to live your purpose and when i think about my why my purpose uh, i'm living it okay so i get to help shape cultures and in those cultures, instill the confidence in the people that inspires the greatness that's inside each and every one of them with alignment in life. Okay, so that's what I like doing in my coaching business. That's what I get to do every day. My wife just, when I leave my office, she goes, you always have a smile on your face. <laughs> and I said, yeah, it's not about running a business for me anymore. I had that, and I realized the very elements of running a business I didn't like at all. But coaching is right in that sweet spot. Every single day I get to do what we're doing right now, Brian, and what you do every day. It's just like, for me, that's my purpose. I think that's why God dropped me on this earth is to help develop leaders, okay, and shape those cultures of, of their organizations. It's fun for me. So when you get to do that, it's it's heaven. We are a, breast, a blessed breed, Ray. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I read a quote a few years ago that was from Michelangelo when describing how he painted this angel in the, uh, the outside of a cathedral. And he said, I saw the angel within the marble and I sculpted until I set him free. And that quote had such a profound impact on me to realize that's my purpose. My calling is to sculpt people, sculpt myself, but sculpt people. And like for, with your purpose and your calling and your passion, it doesn't have to stop at work. It's doing that in every part of our day, every day with our family and our friends is really making the world a better place, making those individuals, those cultures, those teams, those organizations a better place. And we can do that every day wherever we are which I think is such an amazing, amazing gift for that we fell our, we both came into these, these, these careers and, and turned it into our calling. So I, I have a, the utmost respect for you. I've always respected you from afar, Ray, but I definitely respect you more after our conversation today. A great Thank deal you. more. I, I, this is, this is what I expected out of today. So a question I have is, 
Is there any question, Ray, that I did not ask you that I should have, that you'd like to share with the listeners? Any mantra you have or thing that you would like them to take away that you might not have shared yet? Or repeat one you have. Well, um, I have a personal tagline. I'm working on two personal taglines where I think to myself, what is it uh, when people think of me, what I want them to remember? And um, I'll throw both of them out at you. And one of them is everyone wins when the leader gets better. Everyone wins. You think about when the leader gets better, everyone wins. The leader gets better. The, the followers get better, their clientele gets better, it impacts families and stuff like that. Um, and Doug Lenick, one of my mentors, likes to say, and, and there's no end in better. I like that. There's no end to better. When you're always trying to get better, there's no end to it. There's no final destination. So that's one of the taglines I'd leave with everyone. And the final one is um, true leadership is about helping other people be better as a result of your presence and making sure your impact endures in your absence. Because a lot of people think, hey, a great leader is, hey, everything falls apart when the leader's gone. See, that leader was so valuable. I actually think differently. I think the best leaders are the ones that uh, lead people better and the people that actually excel when they're not around. And that's how I try to develop that, that, that thought process, becoming that leader or uh, obviously, they feel your presence when you're there, but it endures in your absence. Can and you repeat how you phrase that the first time, Ray? Like yeah. True leadership is about making people better in your presence? As a result of your presence. As a result, okay. And making sure your impact endures in your absence. Oh, I love it. And for everyone out there, I, I just reinforce what, what Brian just did. Anytime you're, you're, you're talking to anyone and they say something that, makes an impact on you. It is a humongous compliment to the speaker when you say, can you say that again? So I usually just say, thank you for asking for it again, because I said something that's so profound that you want me to say it twice. I kind of like that. (laughs) What a compliment to any speaker. Well, there are a lot of things. For a lot of followers, they don't take that risk and go, hey, could you say that again? I think it's such a compliment. So go ahead if because if it hits you the first time, write it down, memorize it, whatever it is. But a lot of people just let it roll off and they forget it within 48 hours. Well, I'm going to double compliment you. So because I I'm, I'm tr- true leadership is about making people as re- better as a result of your presence and making some- sure your impact. Making sure your impact endures in your absence. Making sure your impact. Okay. Um, so I'm going to repeat that to the audience. The two things that Ray just said, everyone wins when leaders get better. So whether you're a leader, in a tech, officially a leader or a parent or a teacher or a doctor or a coach, everyone gets better. Everyone wins when the leader gets better. And then true leadership is about making people better as a result of your presence and making sure your impact endures in your absence. <laughs> I you mean, we, we, we could, we could have just said those two things and had, and changed lives with just those two phrases, I think. Well, I'm wrestling which one I'm going to use as my personal tagline. So I'm just um, throwing them out there and see what people think. <laughs> oh, well, uh, there, anything else, Ray, that we can, that, I mean, is there anything else you want to share? I'm going to, uh, t- can you talk a little bit about think to perform? Cause I have the utmost respect for the individuals I know who I've known there. Can you talk a little bit about them, about what you do there and how people, I, I have the contact information I'm going to share with the audience here, but anything you want to share? Well, I, what I share is uh, our mission, I think, to perform is to make a positive difference every day. It's one of the reasons why I, I love what I do is I'm aligned with that, that, that mission and our vision is we enhance the world through improving the decision making and performance of the people and organizations we touch. Okay, and that's what we're all about. And actually, I work with a, a great group of people, um, and we're, we're pretty darn good at it. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I, I'm not a big um, promoting blowing horns and stuff like that type of person, um, but I appreciate your invitation to the the, uh, the Bamboo Lab. Um, I've listened to your show before, but this is the first time that you and I formally got to talk for any extended period of time. So I enjoyed it. Well, I can tell you that because of all the knowledge you have in that head and all that experience and wisdom you share, this will not be our last time. Hopefully if if I have anything to do with it for sure. (laughs) Well, all right. Well, I appreciate it. And thank the audience for 
listening for the full uh, 45 minutes or so. Yeah, we thank you, Ray, and we'll have you back. Um, it's a pleasure. I respect, I respect you a great deal, and I can't thank you enough. An audience, I want to share with you, um, think to perform, I want to share with you a contact uh, phone number you can call. And if you are interested in look, just discussing their services, for one, get on their website. They have a great website. I know three or four people from there, and there are people who I have had respect for my entire career. This is the first time I've gotten to know Ray, but a couple of other ones I've had contact with. One of them will be on the, on the episode, on the podcast soon. But their phone number is 855-696-5082. That's 855-696-5082 if you want to talk to somebody directly and learn a little bit more. But please get on their website. It's simple. Do you type in think in the number two? Think to perform will pop up right away. So please get on. All right. Well, all of you, Bamboo Pack, you can probably, I'm sure you have a pen of paper and you're going to listen to this podcast two or three times. And we welcome you to do that and take Ray's wisdom and his experience to heart because this guy has been, he's been around. He's got more respect in the industry as much as anybody I know. That's for sure. Um, and everybody I talk to says, you got to have him talk about leadership. You got to have him talk about leadership. You got to have him tell you some stories. He's so good at it. And we were, he was, they were proven correctly today. So Bamboo Pack, we thank you for being a, uh, uh, listening today, and we'll be back again next week unless we release a special edition or later this week. In the meantime, please get out there, follow us, rate us on Pandora, Spotify, uh, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio. I think we're on 35 platforms right now. Please rate us and then share us with three to five other people. Share the content. The wisdom my guests share is is too valuable to hold alone we have to share this with the world and make it let them take it from there in the meantime get out there and sculpt your lives change the world strive for your best show love and respect to others and live consciously all right god bless you god bless your family god bless your friends and by all means god bless those amazing dreams you carry in your heart bye-bye